Welcome to a reflection about the special role that our ocean plays for the Earth system and humanity. When humans first arrived on the planet, they were looking at the ocean as a source for them for food, but really also as this vast open space, and they were curious about it. They were thinking about sea monsters coming out of the ocean, the ocean connecting them to eternity. But on the other hand, they also had mermaids and the beautiful creatures of the ocean that keep them inspired. But the ocean was vast, big, unfathomable, seemingly endless. Now, as ocean discovery advanced, we've been charting the oceans. We're seeing that the world is a planet, a circle, not a disk anymore. There seemed to be a bit of a finiteness to the ocean. But the way we behaved and interacted with the ocean is we thought we could take out of the ocean whatever we wanted and put back into the ocean what we don't need without any limits. This interaction with the ocean certainly worked okay when it was just a few of us, but as industrial capabilities grew, more toxic substances showed up, the certainty led to some challenges. At the same time, at about at the middle of the 20th centuries, people thought about, well, maybe there might actually be a limit to growth. The planet is finite. So we were thinking about planetary boundaries, these areas around our planet that you don't want to cross. You don't want to overuse certain aspects. You don't over want to use the food, the water. You don't want to pollute the environment. So there are limits to what we can do as humanity with our planet before it becomes not supporting any more of our life forms. On the other hand, during my lifetime, the number of people on our planet has doubled already. We're now at 7 billion people. Soon we'll be approaching 9, 10, 11. And the big question is, is there a safe and just operating space that is confined on the outside by our one planet, our one ocean, and on the inside, ever-growing populations with more affluence, needing food, water, air, energy, all the things that make our modern life possible. And sometimes we forget that it's the ecosystem services that really support our life on the planet. We need the ecosystem for water, food, air that we breathe, we don't need it in a pristine way. We can use it, we can perturb it, but not too much. So it still is able as a healthy system to support us with important functions. When we think about the ecosystem, we try to classify the things they do for us. The first class is what sometimes we call the regulating services of the environment. So for, when you think about the ocean, it regulates the climate system that allows us to live on our planet. The oceans in particular, which their big heat capacity, keep climate fluctuation at a bay. Climate has been very stable over the last 20,000 years and allowing civilization to grow, our business to be very finely tuned on a certain climate regime, and it allowed us to operate. On the other hand, there's provisioning services. Provisioning services are these things that we take out of the ocean to support us. Half of the oxygen we breathe comes from the ocean. 15% of the food we eat comes from the ocean that helps us, in particular in coastal societies. Most of the rain that makes agriculture possible has its source in the ocean. And certainly an increasing number of raw materials like sands, oil and gas, copper is coming out of the earth system and including more and more from the ocean. These same provisional services also have positive sides. The ocean is potentially capable of providing us renewable energy. There's an estimate that about 15% of that could come out of the ocean from green energy like tidal plants, like ocean waves or wind farms. Last but not least, the ocean supports us in their cultural services. We go to the ocean to enjoy the seascape. We have religious practice around the ocean. We really love the ocean for the culture that they allow for us. But let's talk about, for the, about the economy for a little bit because that's seemingly what drives our societies. It is estimated that three to six trillion US dollars is the economic worth of our planet ocean. 90% of the global trades goes across the oceans. 95% of all the telecommunications, including this video segment, comes through sea cables. Fisheries and aquaculture provide half of the population with food. Coastal tourism is the largest market segment that we have on the planet right now. It's about 5% of the GDP and 6% of global employment. The expanding knowledge about the ocean gives us access to new substances, pharmaceuticals, food substitutes, and many other things that we get from the coastal ocean, but also increasing the deep sea. 
13 of the 20 mega cities are in coastal regions, really have a tight interaction with the ocean system. But on the other hand, our interaction with the ocean has also led to some level of decline. And it's because the governance of the ocean is rather weak. You could kind of say the way we interact on the ocean is like a rogue wave. There's not much controlling us there. The ocean is under threat by the growing number of people and the way we interact with them. In some ways you could say it's benign neglect of most of us, but a few actors who are really disruptively and recklessly using the ocean, which gives us that cycle of decline. The World Ocean Commission has identified five elements that really were the main reasons for that declining ocean ability to provide ecosystems. It's the demand for resources, minerals, oil and gas, energy, sand, living resources. It's technology advances that we have to access the ocean in ever new ways with drill rigs, big fishing fleets, big infrastructure. And certainly it's overfishing that is a big concern for us. And that is in many ways only possible because of heavy substitutes that allow overcapacities of the fishing industry to ever more fish and cause damage to our environment. Climate change, the loss of biodiversity, and habitat loss in general are the other aspects that provide an ocean that is more seen as being in decline. Weak high seas governance, it's patchwork, sectorial, individual. Nations don't cooperate. They don't have systems so they can cooperate and have good governance for an ocean that we think about tomorrow. At the same time, I see a ray of hope on the horizon. In September 2015, the world's nation around the world came together to think about a concept for sustainable development. They have agreed on 17 ambitious sustainable development goals, and it was the small island states of our nations that really said, we must have a sustainable development goal for the ocean. The ocean is our livelihood. How can we have goals without the ocean? And that really led to an ambitious goal on the ocean. Overall, I think this reminds us that all people of our planet depend on the ocean. We should think of the ecosystems that support our life and we should think about how we can keep them healthy, productive and be good stewards about them, conserve them. At the same time, we've seen rapid decline of our ecosystems because of more affluent and growing society. We have excessive pressures on fish stocks, on the coastal zone, on sand, on pollution, plastics. But at the same time, I think together it unites us this scientific and intellectual quest, what is the biggest challenge of our times? To me, the biggest challenge of our times is to think about how can we take the turn, transform our lifestyles to become more sustainable, to get towards a sustainable pathway that allows us to occupy that safe and just operating space for humanity. So from my point of view, we should really think about that we have one planet to go around and that planet has only one ocean.